Hello, and welcome to another episode of Screen Bites, our thought leader series where we learn from industry experts about the latest trends and challenges from across the conversion TV space. I'm your host, Michael Beach. This week, I'm joined by James Rook. James is currently the general manager at Effective and has an expansive background at companies including Free Will and Time Warner. You'll be hard pressed to find someone with better ideas for driving the industry forward than James. Please enjoy my conversation with James Rook. All right, uh, James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excellent. We'll start you off with an icebreaker. Uh, we ask all of our guests, uh, what was your first job? My first real job? Sure, either. Um, my, my, my first real job uh, out of college was I joined uh, Ernst & Young um, in the UK out of the London office and joined their consulting practice, really because I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. And I thought, why not go and um, get a broad set of experiences, getting to see lots of different companies, and maybe that would help me understand what I wanted to what I wanted to do next. Um, so the specific team I joined was uh, kind of kind of hardcore team that was focused on 10, 12 week, uh, as we call them, analysis and design projects, which is go into companies, go and do kind of current state analysis of what's going on identify pain points and root causes, um, go to um, future state design of what, what the answers should be, business case and implementation plan. And so I did that across um, all different types of industries, like oil and gas and financial services and retail. And that was sort of my introduction and my training ground to, to start to start my career. Well, how'd you get from the consulting side of the media space? Um, so I, uh, I got an opportunity to move from the US to, uh, sorry, from the UK to the US. I'd never been to New York before and I got a call from Ernst & Young saying, hey, um, your skill set's needed in the US. Do you want to come over for a year? Um, I was going to say no. And my dad said, worst thing that can happen is you go over there, you don't like it, you come back. So I said, yes. Um, you know, it happens to be now uh, 18 years I've, I, I've been here, but moved across with Ernst & Young and to join their media entertainment um, practice. Um, doing those same types of, of projects I did in the UK um, and then spent the next kind of four years uh, working across the whole media supply chain. From I lived in LA for three years, working uh, within the movie studios at sort of Warner Brothers, helping to scale their home video division as DVDs was the hot thing at the time back in kind of 2003, all the way through to uh, working with Walmart as they were looking to stand up their first um uh, digital video store, and then into sort of book publishing, um, cable networks and MVPDs. And the common theme across all of them was because it was you know, 2003, 2008, it was the time where this thing called digital was becoming a word that people were scratching their heads and saying, I guess we better do something about this. So I, all my work was with more traditional companies that were looking to understand what this word digital meant and how um, how they should kind of pivot their businesses uh, accordingly. Um, uh, but after a while, decided that I, I, I didn't want to be a life, a life consultant. And so moved, uh, as we say in consulting, to client side and joined uh, Time Water Cable uh, in their media division, um, running, running the strategy business, uh, the strategy practice. Um, and, uh, and then from there, went to, um, went to Free Will, um, decided I wanted to go work at a venture back company um, and go scale something and got the, the opportunity to join Free Will back in about 2011, 2012 and spent the next seven, seven years of my career there. That's great. Well, how, uh, that was pre-acquisition to, to Comcast or? That was pre-acquisition. So I, I got bought in um, to the executive team to set up a new business, which was uh, an advisory business at the time. Um, the board was looking at ways to diversify revenue and free will was still pretty early. Um, and they wanted someone that had been in consulting that understand the client base that free will was going after, which was obviously, as you know, the larger programmers and MVPDs and, uh, and was silly enough to take a, take a big pay cut and, and come in and try scale something. So, um, it was three years prior acquisition. So. I built that team. I then um, at Free Will was asked to build out uh, the marketplace business, which is now the largest part of the Free Will business. So I did that. I then became chief revenue officer of Free Will. Um, then the acquisition happened. 
And after that, um, a couple of other acquisitions happened. So I was asked to take the freewheel software business, the sell side software business, so really the ad server business, um, uh, an acquisition we made of a, of, of a su supply side platform called Sticky Ads out of France, and then Visible World, um, which is uh, a company was a company focused on kind of uh, household addressable advertising. I took those three assets, merged them together into a single global uh, sell side software entity, um, and general managed that until I until I left um, at the end of two thousand and nineteen. That's great. What a tremendous success. Uh, you know, Free Will's been all the way back to starting up to you know, being a great acquisition. Um, well, would you mind giving our group, you know, effective today, kind of, you know, where they fit overall in the convergent TV industry and then kind of more uh, about your role there? Yeah, sure. So, so, um, so, so my role, first, I, 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 um, I'm responsible for running effective. So we're a, a 3,000 plus person. Um, media company um, that works every day really hard to uh, bring our assets together um, in order to deliver audiences for marketers more effectively than they can get from other places. Um, and we do that across 66 markets across across the US. Um, the, the, the effect of business um, as it fits in the in the landscape within Comcast, firstly, is we're part of Comcast Advertising. Comcast Advertising has um, two major kind of companies. Part of it, one is Freewheel, uh, which we just talked about, and then I sort of jumped over the wall and came to the other side, which is a which is effective. Uh, Freewheel, of course, is primarily focused on software and um, for both buy side and sell side, and the marketplace business. Uh, effective uh, is the media entity. Um, and what we do is sort of bring together um, our scale premium inventory that's both uh, television in inventory and streaming inventory, um, leverage the first party deterministic data assets that we've got. Um, so we're able to go to clients, enable them to kind of plan, target, deliver, and then prove, um, prove performance uh, wherever that audience, uh, audience is. Excellent. And how do the, the two companies kind of work together? Um, so, so, so firstly, um, they, as I said, I said a second ago, they, um, they're both under the same umbrella of Comcast advertising, but they're, they're separate companies with, with separate capabilities and separate missions. Um, that's kind of important because free will, as you know, um, has such a significant role, uh, to support, uh, television um, and its evolution as the world moves from kind of traditional into IP-based video execution, that the neutrality of free will uh, for the industry is critical. So one, on, on one hand, our relationship with free will is exactly the same as um, it is for any other, any other MVPD or programmer or anyone else that uses free will from a software standpoint. Is there a strategic software provider to us? Uh, there are ad server. Um, um, but we, um, we, we, we treat them as that and they treat us as that. So free will continue, can, can, can continue their mission as being, um, um, software for, for, for the industry. That's number one. Um, number two, however, is being that I came from one side and came to the other, um, I've got the privilege of kind of understanding both businesses and there's, uh, a lot that I'm trying to do to sort of cross pollinate, um, learnings from across the business as it pertains to um, the transformation that I'm driving effective on as I move it from being a, uh, a more a, a more of a kind of local ad sales company to an audience delivery company. Uh, there's a lot of experiences that the Free Will team has that I think our team can benefit on. So examples are we just in 2020 started to light up our inventory so it could be executed um, with the national whole codes um, and with some of our political agencies through programmatic pipes. Um, that's not something that Effective's done before. Um, Free Will has lots of experience, not just from a technology standpoint, um, but from a how do you set up your operations the right way? Um, and how do you think about yield and inventory, et cetera? So the ability to kind of cross pollinate learnings um, where we at Effective can move faster at driving against the pivot points that we need to um, I think is great. And by the way, the, under, the underlying reason to want to do that is because we're all under 
the Comcast Advertising Umbrella, um, it's really great for our talent to learn from each other um, in ways that's good for career development and, and, and all the above. So um, that's, the, that's the second thing I'll say. The third thing is there are examples, not many, but there are examples where clients come to us and say, hey, um, we know that Comcast Advertising has a number of assets that sit under it, um, has effective, um, has free will, and, and by the way, recently um, the, 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 the sales, um, sales capability of Zumo, which uh, Comcast acquired um, pretty recently, came under uh, the Comcast Advertising umbrella, uh, reporting up into, in, in, into my effective team. And the client says, we want to be able to um, uh, uh, simplify how we work with you uh, against a broader relationship that covers maybe, maybe software and media. Um, so we do collaborate there, but only through the lens of how do we make it easier for a client to engage with us, recognizing there are sets of different companies that kind of sit under Comcast advertising. Um, and you know the, the, the same the same way that as you think about Comcast as a broader entity, um, we partner really closely with our, our sister company at NBC um, Universal and look for ways that we can simplify how marketers engage with Comcast more broadly based on the assets we have under the under the overall umbrella. Excellent. Well, you know, definitely want to dig into the kind of addressable and, and kind of what you see the future there in a moment, but. You know, one thing, you know, a couple months back, you and I both presented at the, the 4A's Decisions Conference, uh, and you talked about a three-part framework uh, for buyers and sellers in a cross-screen world. Do you mind walking us kind of through your thoughts on that? Yeah, very, firstly, very much enjoyed our, our, our conversation uh, and um, at, at, at the 4A's. Um, I, um, for, for me there are a series of pivot points that I'm driving the company against and, and they all fit under the umbrella of moving effective from being kind of a local ad sales company to an audience delivery company. Easy statement to make, but sort of what does that mean in, in reality? Um, there's three kind of, as you said, kind of core, um, core pillars that, that, that or, or sort of pivot points that we're driving across. Um, that we think matter for effective, but more broadly matter for, for our clients. The first one is um, accelerating the shift from uh, buying uh, content as a proxy for audience to buying audiences. So moving from content to, to audience-based executions enabled by quality data. Um, the second one is um, moving from linear and TV, uh, sorry, linear and, and sort of digital video are seen as these two separate things to everything being delivered against multi-screen uh, inventory, i.e. i.e. taking away the concept of linear and digital. And it's like, I am marketer, I want to reach an audience and I want to deliver that audience wherever that audience is, agnostic of, of the, the screen that it's being delivered on. Um, and then the third one is if you're gonna if you're gonna live into that value proposition, you have to be able to move from a world where GRPs um, are the currency of how buying and selling takes place to impressions, uh, because impression is the equalizer um, and is the only thing that would enable you to scale an audience-based kind of multi-screen execution. Um, so those are the, that's kind of the three-part framework that I think about every day uh, with regard to how do we move our, um, move our company and move the industry uh, along, those, along those pivot points. And, 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 and the reason why is uh, I believe strongly that doing so is going to set up the, the, the television industry of those that are in kind of multi-screen video as a, as, as a marketing format to be able to deliver better results uh, for the marketers that we serve. Um, and that's good for good, good for marketers and obviously good for those that uh, serve those marketers. Kind of how do you grade the industry overall and the, the progress toward each of those items? Um, so in terms of a pivot to, 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 to audience, I, I would kind of put that as the highest grade, but probably still a B, uh, B minus. Um, 
what was interesting is during um, COVID, um, at least I can only speak for our company, but something pretty fascinating happened. And that was the as programming schedules changed and people's viewing schedules changed um, with everyone moving to work from home that could work from home. Um, um, sports programming going away many of our clients came to us and said, hey, um, how are we going to find those viewers? Where have our viewers gone uh, with sports programming going away or with, with viewing habits changing overall? Um, that was actually really helpful, not just for us, but I think the industry, because it accelerated the conversation around trusting the data. Now, it has to be good quality, first-party deterministic data to be sure, because um, there's lots of data out there, but it's not all created equal. Um, and trusting the data to be able to enable marketers to continue to find and deliver their audiences despite those, those shifts taking place. And what we found is that the conversation uh, changed through necessity, and that has had a lasting effect in terms of the percentage of executions that run through us that are executed against um, against an audience relative to just buying content as a proxy. Now, buying content as a proxy will always, sorry, buying content will always be there, uh, particularly around high value programming like live sports and others, but we've seen a significant shift. So I think I'd rate that, you know, the, the highest. Um, the, the, second, the second highest, because I think people conceptually, um, it's easy, so it's easy to kind of conceptually understand is, um, the lines bleeding between linear and, 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 and digital. Um, the challenge there is that you, we, we will be for a period of time and a number of years living in this hybrid world where there are different tech stacks, uh, tech stacks built for linear, uh, linear advertising delivery versus digital, uh, different measurements, um, and different buying teams still uh, on the agency side. Um, and people on both the, the buy side and the sell side that come from come from the, the come from different perspectives. Those that have sort of grown up through a, a more of a linear channel, and those who have grown up through a digital channel, and have just different expectations and, and different kind of baselines. And so, um, it's going to take some time for those lines to completely disappear. And it's just it's just inventory and and it's just audience. But I feel very confident that, that that's going to happen. Um, I'll say I'll say where we're kind of lagging the most is um, tipping the industry from moving away from GRP to impressions. The good news there is everybody knows it needs to happen. Um, the question is is how, um, and there's obviously kind of a, a lot in the news at the moment on this on this topic. Um, so if you if you believe in a world of audience based executions against uh, against an audience kind of agnostic of, of screen, you have to move to an impression based model. I don't believe in a world that there's going to be one single measurement provider. I think it, I think there will be there will be multiple. Um, I think the ad server itself will be more important in terms of um, in terms of um, that sort of impression count with the right third party me the third party validation. Um, but there is also going to be huge operational benefits on both sell side and buy side by moving to a, a kind of guarantee on impression uh, impression model as well. It gets rid of make good issues in, in many cases that exist on the traditional side. So we are, we are a long way from where we should be, I think, in 2021. But the good news is I think both sides see the need to do it. It is just a question of how to get there. That has back end, as well as the challenges I've highlighted, there are also sort of back end technology considerations and also incentive structure considerations as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on the ad server front. You know, part of this is coming from a digital background, you know, originally, but that's, you know, the, all the focus is on, you know, the new Nielsen and really, you know, a small part of the conversation is about, you know, an ad server for the TV world of the, the future. And to me, that's a much bigger piece. Yeah, no, look, you're, 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 you're spot on. And, and it, although I, I've, I've had a three, you know, three part framework, if I was to add a fourth, um, then the, the fourth is around. Uh, the criticality of proof of performance. Um, I feel super passionately on this one in that um, the, 
the, the, the companies out there that focus on more bottom of funnel proof of performance um, have for many years, as we know, been taking credit for the value that more top of funnel uh, television or multi-screen video provides. I think that's a, a well-known, uh, a well-known um, uh, fact. But the challenge is that the television industry uh, needs to do a better job of proving the the value and proving proof of performance against the metrics that the marketer um, cares about in order to earn um, the incremental share that I think it deserves based on how the data proves it out. Um, and so I am very focused on that as well. And I think the industry is focused on that as well because as the, uh, the, the tech platform companies become more and more powerful, they have an inherent advantage being closer to bottom of funnel. Um, and so the opportunity is for those that play historically more top of funnel is to be able to make proof of performance against whatever that ROI metric is that the, um, the, the marketer cares about kind of standard as, as, part of, um, as part of kind of campaign execution and being able to kind of demonstrate um, the, the ROI in a more apples to apples way plus the halo effect that it delivers on, proof, on um, performance marketing spend, which will rightly remain important. I just think there's an over allocation of share there. And, and it's kind of interesting as you look at, um, if, you, if you look, there's a couple of things that I always bear in mind when I talk to people about this is one is if you look at the fan companies, um, you know, my data's, uh, I think, out of date, but I know in, in, um, in, in 2020, um, the, the spend was close to, I think, you know, around $3 billion from those companies alone, which if you combine them would make them the number one spender on TV out of anyone. So those companies are really smart and they know that television works. Um, and, and the other data point is the, the, the aggressive spending that's happening from direct to consumer companies. Um, I, I know in like 2019, it was nearly like $4 billion, uh, from the top 125 D2C companies poured into TV. The reason that's interesting to me, because I spent a lot of time talking to the direct to consumer companies is they have some of the most sophisticated attribution models out there and they were all born online. They grew their businesses on Instagram and other kind of social platforms. And now they're sort of running out of reach and running out of audience and they're allocating more and more money into kind of multi-screen video, multi-screen TV. Um, and their attribution models are showing, showing that it works. And so there's, there's really interesting proof points out there. And it's now, I think the onus is on, is on us um, to be able to better prove proof of performance day in, day out with our marketers so we can earn the share shift that, that, that we think will be valuable for the marketer in terms of delivering them better overall ROI. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what we find. Anybody, you know, when you get to direct consumer, I mean, they know their, you know, customer acquisition costs are in their lifetime value cold. And, you know, the, the Facebooks and people like that have been able to, uh, to almost price their, their inventory at a completely different way because it meets the, the CAC goal of the advertiser. Yep. Uh, and, and what we find is a lot of times that the premium at the, if you look at it in the impression levels is, is really high, but on the, on the TV side, we haven't yet been able to prove that performance. So we're kind of stuck in this, you know, who, who offers me the lowest CPM uh, battle. And in, in reality, there's probably a lot more value in those impressions than, than the marketer knows. Yeah, you're spot on. Well, we should talk more on this topic because, because you're right. It, it comes down to the, um, you know, at the most basic level, uh, the effect of CPM. Um, but, but even that is too simplistic. I think what you hit on is something that we're really passionate about as well. And that's quality. Um, and uh, that then gets into what's the kind of future of measurement looks like. Uh, what does the future of measurement look like as you move to an impression based model and not all impressions are created equal, um, and quality does matter. And so I, I think that's going to be a, a part of an industry conversation that's going to take place as marketers rightly look for equivalency across, um, how they transact with the platform companies relative to the TV industry. Um, th that's the right goal for marketers. Uh, we on the TV industry have to ensure that that equivalency, um, doesn't put us at, at a immediate disadvantage, 
Um, and it would be if quality isn't a consideration as part of um, how you equivalize uh, impressions, in my, in my personal opinion. Well, one question I want to ask you about is, is local. So do you find you know, have an experience with both uh, local advertisers, national advertisers, obviously under the Com Comcast umbrella, you you have uh, you know, an NBC universal all the way down to an effective. Do you find local being um, more interested in the, the measurement or national and kind of what else do you, is, is unique about local? Um, so, so the highest level, the, the, the thing that's powerful about local, um, for from our standpoint is is twofold one is that um we're able to um target specific audiences down specific audience segments down to specific geos uh to enable those marketers to reach their target customers um in the catchment area that they care about in their own backyard um and so that has benefit in terms of how you manage reaching frequency the right way um, at the geo level. Um, that's nice and helpful, but also um, we find that in a world that is so wild west, uh, and we live in this incredible period in the media industry, both you and I are sort of operating businesses at a time where there's more change than there's ever been before. And it's fascinating to see how it's gonna play out the our local clients same as our same same as kind of other clients but at the local level are inundated with um with uh companies trying to help them uh with advertising and they're looking for sort of fewer trusted consultative partners um and what i like about our company and others like ours is we have a you know 1100 1200 person sales team that's kind of out there and those sellers um are living in the same neighborhoods as the clients that they serve um have built sort of deep rooted relationships in those neighborhoods and with those clients over many years and so we see a big opportunity to be able to, to be able to kind of go arm in arm with our local clients to help them on the journey that as we go on the journey together as we drive against the pivot points that we've got together so for me, I think the, the consultative relationship side is, is as important as the, the technical capabilities that, that uh, can be executed down at, a, down at a local level. Well, one area I think local you know, has been ahead is an addressable, kind of powered by the, you know, the cable company in recent times. You know, a lot of news about national addressable. Kind of what are your overall thoughts on that and, and you know, the overall outlook for national addressable TV? Yeah, so I'm very bullish on 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 addressability, sort of overall. Um, in that, if you going back to what we've talked about earlier, if you think about the full the full purchase funnel, uh, the opportunity for media companies is to be able to partner with marketers to provide sort of full funnel solutions, running from the traditional, hey, we can give you great broad reach. Uh, a top of funnel to drive awareness through sort of mid funnel, more data enabled um, audience executions, which I think becomes the sort of standard and that drives sort of mid funnel um, um, consideration and intent all the way to addressability that sort of supports um, much more um, kind of targeted, how, you know, household targeted level closer to the bottom of funnel. And so, so for me, the first thing to say is I think about addressability. I think about it as a subset of a broader set of sort of full funnel solutions that um, the, the media companies, both national and local, by the way, are able to bring to the table. I think that's good for the telev television industry overall, because I think it makes the television industry more competitive with the, 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 the platform companies that are sort of coming after those dollars. It's kind of number one. Um, number two is, uh, as, as, as Comcast, um, we have a couple of different roles um, as it pertains to addressability. One is, as an inventory owner, um, we, um, we enable uh, addressable capabilities as part of the solution set that Effective takes to the table. We've been doing that for a long time. 
um, as have uh, many other sort of M M B MBPDs. Um, the, 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 the second, actually on that last one, um, just because it ties back to some of my framework from, from earlier, um, we, we recently at Effective um, launched uh, what we call audience addressable, which is allowing our buyers to, for the first time, to have a single impression goal that they can plan, target, deliver, and report against uh, across both streaming inventory and uh, linear inventory, all executed through the free will ad server um, um, down to kind of household addressable level. So we're super excited about that because I think it, it's a proof point on the board around um, a couple of the pivot points we, we mentioned. Move towards audience-based executions, which is addressable as a component of that, and executing everything multi-screen. Um, so that's the inventory side. And then there's, then there's the enablement side. On the enablement side, Comcast has been um, very loud and very consistent for a number of years about we see the industry as stronger together and we want to do everything to be able to empower um, and enable the TV ecosystem to get smarter with regard to how it serves marketers. And one of those areas is enabling um, national programmers with the ability to um, uh, to bring addressability onto the inventory that they that they own, um, so so we play that dual role, and we're so proud of playing that dual role because um, we know that if you're a marketer, um, it's a patchwork of different footprints, and a marketer wants to simplify how they buy at scale, and that's why as I talk about the concept of TV as a platform. TV is historically a set of sort of federated states that have um, have have been kind of competing with each other, and and now you sort of look up and um, those federated states uh, actually have to worry about uh, competition for their business coming from from um, from the outside from the from the fan companies and, and others, and therefore one thing that the tech the tech platform companies do really well and, and credit to them is they make it simple. To, to transact with them. And television needs to do the same. And um, one area to do that is obviously around addressability and ensuring we have uh, where we can common sets of standards and ways of executing uh, and measurements um, so that a marketer can, can do that. So um, that's how I see the, the world of addressability and the sort of role that the MVPD plays. Well, really high level, you know, what's one major thing that uh, you think is really important that nobody's talking about? Oh, um, that nobody's talking about. But if I if I if I had something that nobody was talking about, then uh, then uh, then I probably wouldn't wouldn't tell anyone because <laughs> I would take, take advantage of it. Um, I, I think I think one thing that we that we haven't um, that is being talked about. So I'm not answering your question. Uh, I, I, I get, but is really a really important topic that I'm watching. Is there's a lot of talk about data. Um, all data is not created equal, but there's also the reality of how do you scale data enabled executions uh, across multiple data owners and do it in simple ways that enable marketers to um, to be able to execute at scale um, across different different inventory partners, uh, leveraging different data sets, including their own, while respecting the the privacy requirements of any given data owner um, and the likely regulation that is going to continue to come out of DC. And so the, the concept of sort of decentralized versus centralized um, uh, architectures for, um, uh, for executing against what I just said is something I'm watching really closely. I'm personally... Um, a very big believer that decentralized models will play out um, for a couple of reasons. One is that I think centralized models uh, only help empower the walled gardens, um, which is why they want those. Um, but second, but secondarily, I believe that there's the psychological challenge to overcome with centralized models that decentralized models can overcome. So I think there are. Um, I'm very excited 
about um, the different players out there in the market, including um, including Blockgraph, which is a, a, a joint venture between Viacom Charter and, and Comcast that was born out of uh, out of Comcast, and we we spun it out. Um, that is thinking through what the future sort of operating systems look like for data enablement uh, through in privacy compliant ways. So that's a topic that I think has a lot of legs on it that is really important. Um, and yet there's no kind of clear, clear path in terms of how that's going to play out uh, right now. But um, curious, how, what, what would your answer be on that one? Well, yeah, I like that. Uh, I mean, that's one thing we talk about a lot of, you know, the, you know, we started cross screen five years ago, kind of coming from the buy side. And, and, you know, one theory was that that was the kind of peak uh, fragmentation and that things were going to simplify from there. And I think if anything today, it's more complicated for both buyer and seller than ever. Um, and I don't see that changing in the next, you know, three to five years. Um, just, you know, with you know, privacy regulations, with, you know, companies moving from an open and closed, you know, environment. Uh, it, you know, it ha definitely hasn't gone backwards. Um, and I think for us, I think if I was, you know, big, a big trend that no one talks about, I think just the, the kind of back to your point about measurement earlier, there's just a huge pricing inefficiency overall in the market because people evaluate inventory sources with a different currencies. And then B some platforms are just so easy to use than others that, um, you know, they don't realize it. Like I was, you know, talking to someone at you know, lunch today and that, you know, since 2016, you know, Facebook's gone from 2 million to 10 million advertisers. And, you know, they were able to survive that boycott with their prices still going up because of the long tail. And that long tail in an ad in, a, in an auction environment just keeps driving the prices up. But, pe but people really don't realize it because they price their inventory off of a CPA or some kind of cost per action. And they don't really know what, what it costs relative to anything else. I think that's a big complication that the market's probably a little bit behind on. Yeah, look, I think that's I think that's well said. I mean, it, it goes back to my belief that there's an overallocation towards those performance marketing companies. But you know what? Good on those performance marketing companies like Facebook and others because they've set up a model and a construct that gives them an advantage. Um, the opportunity, though, is there to to to, to um, create more equal footing. Um, but so 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 the good news is, is is you probably do your analyses and we do ours. The the, the data proves it out. And so as I always say to our company, um, it's good when truth is on your side. Yeah. Um, and and that that's a really solid foundation to to build a business off. Um, but then you got to build the business off it, and you got to scale it, and you got to prove it. And um, and that's sort of the opportunity opportunity ahead. Great. Well, I'll get you out of here on one more question. Uh, we ask all of our guests, if you could get everyone on your team to read one book right now, uh, what would it be and why? Um, probably not a good person to ask this, but I, 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 I'll, I'll admit that I'm, I'm, uh, I, I pivoted more to, to podcasts and, and, and blogs that I'm fascinated in, like Stratechery is an example to help broaden my, my reading. Um, that said, um, there was a book I read um, um, recently that I think is really relevant for our employees. Um, it's, probably, it's probably one that someone's raised before. It's quite common right now, which is uh, Atomic Habits from James Clear. Um, and the, the essence of the book is it's, um, it's about breaking um, how you break bad or legacy behaviors and then a system for how you build uh, new behaviors. Um, and what's fascinating is, is it talks about sort of the power of compounding, like compound interest of how sort of many small actions, if you maintain discipline at them over time, can lead to significant change, um, which for me really resonates like in my personal life in terms of, hey, you haven't been, for example, to the gym for a while. Um, it feels like a big effort to get out of bed at 5 a.m. and go to the gym and and uh, and just get straight back in it. But actually, you know, with that gym example, it talks about um, even just getting out of bed and going and stretching in your living room. It's better than not doing it at all because it's kind of incremental incremental change. And and 
and and the reason I raise this for the company is not because I'm making a push for everyone to go to the gym, but it's more that the state of the union that we're in right now as a business is reflective of the state of the union of um, all companies that come from a more traditional media side and are looking to make the pivot to become a sort of next generation uh, media company. I've said earlier, as we look to move from being local ad sales to audience delivery and talk about all the pivots we have, it, it, it requires uh, breaking down legacy behaviors. It requires um, building new muscle. Uh, and that takes time. It takes discipline. It's not easy, as you know. Um, and so I think there's, there's some incredible lessons in there that are applicable for everyone in our company and really for those that are, that are that are looking to embed real sustainable change that enables you to kind of make the the pivot as a company and be successful in the future. So that would probably be the the book I would change. I, I would choose for everyone to to read. Yeah, it's a great recommendation. I I uh, got to read that a few months back, and uh, excellent. Even just how he starts off his story by getting hurt was pretty incredible. Yeah, I'm uh, glad you read it. Okay, um, and so so yeah, so look, I think. I think we can talk a lot about technology change and workflow change and, and, and policy change, which we're talking about every day in our company. Uh, but ultimately, you have to set the cultural foundation and the mindset to, 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 to go on that journey together. So I think you're right. There's lots of lessons in that book about how you, how you do that um, to be in the right mindset and have the right system in place whereby you can actually uh, kind of walk the talk, which is what we all need to do. Excellent. James, I appreciate your time. I've enjoyed the conversation and I know our community is going to love it. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Screen Bites. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. You can find out more about Cross Screen Media at crossscreenmedia.com. And please don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter, Stay to the Screens. You can find us on social media at Cross Screen Media. Join us next time for more insights and analysis straight from the experts.